go, let's go, let's go. Peace, peace, peace. Let's get the likes up. Let's get the likes up. Get them likes up. Get them likes up. Come on. We need to see at least 20 before I go, man. It was 18 and now they disappeared. Don't know what happened. Peace, peace, peace. Smash the like button. Smash the blood clad like button, yo. Wow. All right. So, put this in there. Y'all can hear, right? Mic check, mic check. Can you hear? Hey, Gullah, can you hear me? Peace. Peace, everybody. Can you hear me? Mic check? Mic check. Mic check, mic check. Can you hear? No problem. All right, let's go. Run away, slash. Sprinting like a deer, shift the face like a werewolf, quoting from the prayer book. Oh, Lord. Elders back there, put you know that fear make a motherfucker still look. I done see them lynch grand pops in my sleep, hear them shackles when they slam lock. Fuck mass and his ham hocks, let them pick his damn clock, probably get my hands chopped. But it's a chance worth taking. Freedom land will be my last location. The overseers got them hound dogs chasing my pounding heart racing since the part from the foundation. Late, they just whip Lil Willie. He can't walk now, they fifth to some chilies. Why talk? Feel niggas fear me. House niggas hear me, but they still a little leery. Yeah, just wanna be free. Got a baby boy three. I don't want him like me. Please. Just let me get across. No one's freedoms in the north. Just like Jesus on the cross. Die for our sins. I die for my kids. Just for the sake of see slavery in. Can't they see we all men? All being hated for the color of our skin. It's hard to translate it, but my brother only 10. Working in the field, got him working for a meal. I want to be still, so please send a sign. I'm just another nigga with his ass on the line. Fine, but you know I'm here trying, trying to stay alive while everybody dying. Back at the plantation, mama did crying, but I told mama dear not to care because I'm a lion. No lying, I know I'm a nigga, but now I'm a nigga that made it to the river. God damn it, Billy, tell my looks. A nigga that made it to the cop that I'm living a dog dog news and sit. Now, shoot. Stop. Stop, boy. I'm just a runaway slave. I stay running till they on me in my grave. Either that or they lock me in a cage. Throw away the key, will I ever be free? I'm just a runaway slave. That's right. I stay running till they on me in my grave. Either that or they lock me in a cage. Peace, family. Welcome to MBK, the home of knowledge, wisdom, understanding of the black man, woman, and child history in America. Today's presentation is called the Underground Railroad Secret Society, the Order of the Men of Oppression. Why did I pick this topic of the Underground Railroad? Because it expresses our form of resistance to um, slavery and it shows the free blacks organizing themselves, utilizing the things that they had available to them, Christianity, Freemasonry, and turned it into something of their own to free the people and liberate their 
families and keeping alive their thoughts of the ancestors. So as we get to this next slide here, you see it's called Underground Railroad Beginnings. The Underground Railroad is said to not be able to be pinpointed to be the origin of it. All the Underground Railroad means is that it is roots that go into pre-states or Pacific areas where slavery was not intact. So from the written records, this is what we have here as the beginning of the Underground Railroad coming towards the 17, late 1700s. So 1775, this organization here is called the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage, later called the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. This is the first organization to aid fugitive slaves. So this happens in Pennsylvania. Now, after this happens something else. See the date here is 1780. This is called the Gradual Emancipation Law in Pennsylvania. It is the first of its kind in the United States, and it sets the stage for the development of the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. Not only does gra gradual emancipation um, set this down for a route to freedom, it also deals with the foundation of the Black community in Philadelphia. Gradual emancipation does not mean that the uh, whole entire people are free. It just means that they slowly allowed people to be free within their states and confined to new laws that gave them a sort of liberty so that they can organize and build the community for themselves. The original Underground Railroad has roots that goes into Florida and then it goes into Mexico. But towards the 1810s or 1820s, this is when you see the Underground Railroad that we're going to be talking about today. So... As you can see, this was an issue or a problem. So here it says, this organization, the Philadelphia Abolition Society, was mentioned in a letter by George Washington, one of his slaves had received its assistance. And if this practice, this is George Washington speaking, and if this practice of this society is not discontinuance, Washington wrote, none of those who misfortune it is to have slaves as attendants will visit the city if they can possibly avoid it. This is Paul Boyle, Washington, the Quakers and Slavery Journal of Negro History. You can see the date there. So Mr. Uh, Washington was upset about his slave escaping and being assisted. And because of this, this will lead his um, office of government to push these laws. And these are called the Fugitive Slave Laws. This one here, 1793, is a law an owner only had to show proof that a slave was his property. Many northern states did not like this law. They made their own laws instead, and the South got angry. So later on in the presentation, we're going to see how these northern states got free and the states that we're going to be dealing with. So this one, 1850 law, strict punishments made more northerners obey. Anyone caught helping a runaway slave had to pay a large sum of money or go to jail. Those were the consequences, but uh, as we can see, there was revolutions and all kind of resistance in the north, so all of them did not obey. Now, it is stated when you study the Underground Railroad, and if you look at the earlier writings, it is said that um, the Quakers... And so the European just helped us, which in cases, some of them did help us. But they leave out the work that was done by the black men and black women to free themselves. They'll paint the narrative and put shroud of some kind of myth to make you believe that we were waiting for these people to free us. So... I just have a quote from one abolitionist speaking in 1837 of the nature of the Underground Railroad and the free states. White abolitionist John, James G. Bryan reported that such matters are almost uniformly managed by the colored people. 
now to get into the organizing of some terms that deals with the Underground Railroad. So, you see, these are conductors. Conductors led slaves from station to station. These stations are usually houses. They could be barns that um, house the free people uh, to get clothing, etc., until they go to the next state, the next station or house. Station masters, they hid slaves in their homes. Agents led slaves to root to the roots or what is termed the Underground Railroad. Conductors and agents and station masters, you'll see that there are people that is a part of the Underground Railroad that will play all three of these roles. Some of them are Pacific with station masters and conductors or agents. Um, the agents and some conductors actually went within the South and they act that out of slave and they freed some of the people to get them to go on their roots. Now, when we speak about the Underground Railroad, the first name that pops in our head is Harriet Tubman. It is like shameful to me that when you think of the Underground Railroad, this is the only person we know about. When you have numerous um, organizations that is a part of this network so the underground railroad just to go a little further a little little more is a network of individuals and institutions dealing with abolitionists reverends independent groups like vigilance committees set up by black people to help free the people most of the people only knew their role they didn't they wasn't all into their contact with each and every single person because the Underground Railroad is a route that stretch, stretches to 1,400 miles. So now, I just put this here so you can see it. This is called the Station Master, which is uh, one of the... Hold on here. Oh, this is the right page. Sorry about that. These are called Station Masters. So the Station Master is one of the jobs that I spoke about earlier. And when you look through here, you'll see numerous different names. Some of them are Europeans, some of them are Africans. The subject of this discussion is going to be Lambert William, which is right here. And you'll see a bunch of different names at this point. And I'm going to go on to the next one. These other ones are rescues of slaves. So you'll see John Brown, John Fairfield, all of these specific people. This guy here, John Fair Fairfield, he's an interesting person because he is of a European, but he was an abolitionist. And the subject that we're going to be speaking about, dealing with William Lambert, he used to be a tailor and he used to make his coat. And this specific coat that he made for this individual was to that so that this guy can carry guns and shoot his guns through different points in his coat. This guy, John Fairfield, used to um, arm all of the people on the Underground Railroad, and the Europeans didn't like it. So this guy here, he's a, you should look this guy up, and the rest of these people here. Here again, we have conductors. Look at all of these specific names. I'm leaving this here for people to research. And you'll see Harriet Tugman is in there. You'll see all of these people names inside of here. And you'll see John Brown, like I said, and a whole bunch of other individuals. This is just to let you know, to give you a brief synopsis of the network that is involved with this underground railroad. This man here, name is William Still. Um, he is known as the godfather of the uh, Underground Railroad because of, he kept these specific records. This is his book. And the name of it is long title, the Underground Railroad, a record of facts, authentic narrative letters, narrating the hardships, hair breath escapes, and death struggles of the slaves and their efforts for freedom as related by themselves and others or witnessed by the author, together with sketches of some of the largest stockholders and most liberal aiders and advisors of the road. This is from the Philadelphia Foundation Society. This is just a 
very important book that I think you should get if you want to get into the beginnings of the Underground Railroad and understand how the black community was formed in Philadelphia. Moving along. Now, the objective of what I'm going to be dealing with in this presentation is the Detroit, Michigan area. This area is the last stop on the Underground Railroad, which led into Canada. So we're going to explore the reasons why people wanted to go to Detroit and why they wanted to go to Canada. 1787, the Northwest Ordinance banned slavery in the Northwest Territory what becomes the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The ordinance together will state emancipation laws create a free north. So now you can look at the dates on here, but you can see that this specific ordinance now makes these specific areas a uh, safe haven for people who come from the south to the north. Detroit was the state last stop on the Underground Railroad because it was generally the final stop before achieving freedom. There are at least seven paths that led slaves from the various points of Michigan to Canadian shore, and it is estimated that 200 Underground Railroad stops existed throughout Michigan between 1820s and 1865. These are some of the routes of the Underground Railroad. When you look at this map, these Blue marker here represents the free states. These right here represent slave states. So again, what I was telling you about earlier, you see Texas, this will run into Mexico around here. All of them go to the north, north, north. They're all going to Canada. All right. So I'm just going to read this quick. Three lines from Kentucky led to Indiana to Caspiolos in southwestern Michigan. The fourth line left from Kentucky slaves along the eastern side of Indiana to Coldwater, Michigan, where it divided into several routes, all going to Detroit. Missouri slaves might have passed through Illinois by one or six or seven lines, and many of them continued on to Detroit as well. In the 1840s, what is today Midwest, but was then considered the West, one route ran from Quincy, Illinois, to Galesburg, Princeton, Chicago, and South Southern Michigan ended in Detroit. By 1854, the route extended across Iowa, and some fugitives came to Detroit by way of St. Louis and Alton, Illinois, from Detroit, running the race across the Detroit River to enter Canada and freedom. Now, now it's very important. All of these places, Chicago, Detroit, Jasboro, um, Indiana, all of Kentucky, all of these places have stories of Pacific Africans that helped assist the people. Some of them are revolutionaries, and we're going to be covering these states by state so that we can understand the free blacks in America, how those uh, communities were formed. But we're moving along. Now, as you see, I put Canada was the goal. Underground Railroad beginnings. Now, it says Detroit location made at the primary crossing point to Canada for fugitive slaves fleeing the upper south states of Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Western Virginia. So this is the reason why Detroit was a big attraction for those to attain their freedom because of its location. It says, Canada granted freedom to slaves who crossed over the border from the United States. Slavery in the entire British Empire was not officially abolished until the Imperial Act of 1833, which took effect on August 1st, 1834. So we see Canada granted freedom to slaves who crossed that border of the United States, which made Canada the goal. And we understand that the history of Canada deals with after the Revolutionary War for the Black Loyalists who fought on the British side. They moved to Nova Scotia in the 1770s, and it's a long history we have here. Now, this right here set the stage. The stage for this act was set earlier on May 5th, 1772. Lord Chief Justice of Great Britain, Great Britain William Murray, Earl of Mansfield, ruled that any slave reaching British oil was automatically set free. The providential government of Upper Canada passed the law in 17. 1993 granted freedom to all children born of slave mothers who, excuse me, when they reached the age of 25. 
Freedom seek Seekers settled in Anatario, while young St. Catherine's near the Niagara River, Colchester, Winchester, Amherstburg near Detroit, London, Chapman, Dresden, Oro, Toronto, and the Queen's Bush. So all of these are settlements on the Underground Railroad. You'll see this right here. If you blow this up, you'll see the Dawn Settlement. You'll get to see who founded it. And then we'll get to understand why these people chose to come there and what they were doing in these specific areas. Why this is important because some of our ancestors moved there. Some of them could be our actual ancestors. But now we understand the reason why Detroit was chosen as the last stop. We understand why Canada was chosen as the last stop. And this specific law that was passed could be leading up to the Revolutionary War to try to get uh, free blacks to fight for them on their side. Moving along, the source for that map that you saw with the roots is from this book, The Underground Railroad, A Slavery to Primary Sources. Leave it there for a second. Okay, this man here, William Lambert, he is the subject of this specific presentation that deals with the secret order, but I want to uplift this person and his associate, George D. Depatis, and talk about their life and all of the things that go into this Underground Railroad Network and their secret society. So we're going to go through some things that this young man accomplished. It says, William Lambert was born free and educated in Jersey in 1817. He ran a tailor business and dry cleaner business. He was the founder of the St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. He founded the Color Vigilance Committee. He organized the first state convention of colored citizens. He co-founded the Underground Railroad Secret Order. He founded a school and a library. His Underground Railroad be work actually began in New Jersey, working with John Fairfield. Um, that operation with John Fairfield originated during the time Lambert lived in New Jersey, an associate with the 50 to 60 McKenzites who took willing people out of slavery. Um, he has a, a, a narrative, which he talks about his life, the secret order, and these people called it McKenzite, which is supposed to be from Canada, which these people are supposed to be um, some relation to uh, the McKenzie family who had a reform, fam a reform movement in Canada. They were said to be like vagabonds or like thieves, but what they would do is they would kidnap um, some of the slaves. They would sell them to people on the Underground Railroad, and then these people on the railroad would be able to take them into the safe houses, etc. Here's a source for this, Underground Railroad in Michigan, Carl E. Moe. This man was his associate, George D. Pat Tiste. This picture here, you see he's called the Militant Underground Railroad uh, Conductor. And that's from the historical collection in the Detroit Public Library. Here are some of the feats that this man um, did to help free the people. It says, D. Pat D. George was born in 1818. He was one of the Underground Railroad's most prolific conductors operating first along the Ohio River in Madison, Indiana, and later became a leader in the Underground Railroad's most active gateway to Canada at Detroit, Michigan. Depathy was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, of a free black, or free black parents. He was the president of the Color Vigilance Committee. He departed, he purchased a bakery, and after selling it, he went into transportation business operating the steamboat T. Whitney between Detroit and Sandusky. During the Civil War, the Patsy helped recruit a black regiment from the state of Michigan. He was a co-founder of the Secret Order of the Men of Oppression. He also utilized what we used, what we called certificates of freedom, which were sometimes counterfeited to aid the fugitives on their way, and genuine certificates were said to have been used, presumably on loan, to be used again. Here's just a little clip of what this person did with his um, certificate of freedom. George D. Tepasby used his old certificate dated City of Richmond from his Virginia days registered in the office of Hustings 
Portland said city, the 22nd day of January, 1865, number 606. George D. DePathis of Boyer, about five feet, seven and a half inches high, and about 20 years of age, who was born free, so began his freedom papers. Two, he could only lend his papers to light-skinned men, about five foot seven, and around his own age. Even so, it is said that he used this certificate 33 times to aid slave escape, and during his eight years of an agent in Madison, he started 100, or he helped free 108 fugitives on the way to Canada in his own wagon. So this person is very important. I think we need to um, uplift this person. He is also a conduct, uh, conductor, and we need to look at this person's history because there is more about him. We're just covering his foundation. Okay, why did um, Lambert and George want to come to Detroit. We already discussed, we discussed the geographical region and the political region, but there was something else that took place in this specific area. Now, this is called the uh, Black Burns Riot or Detroit's first race riot. Here you'll see here a uh, plaque, Kentucky fugitives to Canada. It'll describe briefly um, the event or the ordeal that took place. But I'm just going to read this one because this is a very important story. It says, the rescue of Miss Blackburn was a general affair carried out by two unidentified women who visit her jail. The names of married women from this time period are not always easily defined. In this case, one source gives Miss Blackburn's name as Ruth, Michigan, and the Fugitive Slave Acts 4. This is the source and the other as Lucille. I came as a stranger. That's another source for this. Now, this is important because you have women who went into this specific jail and freed her. You had black women who went to this jail and freed this woman. Okay. One of the women exchanged clothes with the prisoner who then walked out with her face covered pretending to be weeping. By the time the ruse was discovered, Lucy or Ruth was safely in the hands of friends. So this is how the wife escapes. The Mr. Blackburn story is a little different. It says this, a mob attacked the sheriff with stones and clubs and then transported the Blackburn across the river to Canada. The violence had a chilling effect and frightened the white community on both sides of the border. The secretary a war sent federal troops to Detroit and city authorities arrested 30 black men and sandwiched the Canadians first imprisoned the couple, then refused to extradite them, citing that self-death was not a crime. Under their law, soon the pair was released and the black burns went to become wealthy citizens of Toronto. So what specifically happened here with uh, Mr. Blackburn is that they came into the courtroom they tried to um, stop the proceedings. They ran in there, and they freed this specific person. And this right here caused it a, a, a very, very, very big riot. Now, this is called the Colored Vigilance Committee that was uh, founded by William Lambert. And... We're just going to read from this newspaper here. This is called The Signal of Liberty. So it says, in 1842, William Lambright, Robert Banks, Madison, J. Lightfoot, and William C. Monroe formed the Colored Vigilance Committee of Detroit. And in addition to aiding runaways, the committee aimed to secure voting rights for African-American men and see that black children received an adequate education equal to white students. The organization died in the 1840s. But Lambert and others revived it after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. This time around, the organization took on aspects of a fraternal order and focused more directly on helping runaways escape to Canada on the railroad with the assistance of Black Steamboat on owner George D. Baptiste. Lambert and other members of the Color Vigilant Committee smuggled fugitives to Canada. William Lambert. Moreau declared their plans to form the Colored Vigilant Committee of Detroit. Dissatisfied with the abolitionist and reform organizations where boards were dominated by whites, 
Lambert and Monroe expressed the desire to create a committee of vigilance from among our own people to watch over our interests, to draft our petitions to legislator, praying that we may enjoy the elected franchise in common with other men, or to do any business which we may deem vital importance to our people. So you can see that there were abolition com um, commissions that was around, but these men felt that they wasn't doing enough. And you will find from looking at this specific history that it was the black people who were more aggressive on to freeing our people by any means necessary. Now, once um, our brother comes to Detroit, he automatically gets into the abolitionist movement. You can see that he um, is the chair or the founder of this specific organization of this committee. But he is known for this specific incident. I need to highlight this incident so that people can see it. This person is called the so-called fugitive slave. His name is Robert Cromwell. Now, it says that Cromwell had escaped from slavery in Arkansas, setting first in Indiana and then moving to Flint, Michigan. He wrote to his former master, John Dunn, asking to buy his sister for $100. Although he dated the letter from Montreal to mislead the former master, the Flint, Michigan postmark gave away his true location and Dunn set off to recapture him. Cromwell realized his error and he sought Lambert's help. Hoping to evade capture, he left another man in charge of his barbershop and moved to Detroit where he opened the restaurant. But Dunn traced him there and tricked him into entering the courthouse. Federal law would have forced the U.S. District Judge to order that Dunn could take the Cromwell back. So when Judge Ross Wilkins, who sympathized with the former slave, heard the commotion on the floor below him, he hid apparently in the attic. So we have a judge hearing the commotion, and he's hiding in the attic due to the people in the North who are not going for this specific um, thing that this man is trying to do. Cromwell tried to escape out the window while the court clerk, George Ball, warned Cromwell against coming upstairs. Lambert and DePasti arrived with a lawyer named George Rogers, but they could not get in the building until Ball passed the key from the window. They entered with a score of others and rescued Cromwell from the courthouse, while a crowd includes some Irishmen who taunted Dunn and the man still blocked Dunn from taking chase. Others put Cromwell on a skip and off to Canada. The aftermath, Lambert hired lawyers and jailed a done for nine months so we can see what this committee is doing um i brought up these two specific stories especially on the blackburn story on how they went in there and they freed this person they also wound up killing the sheriff um to show you what the climate was like and during this specific climate what the black people did in order to solve the Pacific problems that the people had. So I wanted to bring this history so that we can have an understanding on what was going on at those times and what the organizations that these men built were doing. Now, these right here are gonna be the sources for the Order of the Men of Oppression, the Negro Secret Order sources. Um, the, it goes under many names. It was on the uh, African Mysteries, uh, the League of Freedom, Order of Immigration, Order of Oppression. So these newspapers are the actual primaries for this actual um, order because they're coming directly from William Lambert and from George D. DePapsi. Um, there's other sources in here that we're going to go over, but I'm mainly going to be focused on William Lambert's actual testimony. All right. It's the Detroit Post, May 15, 1870, and the Detroit True Road Tribune, January 17, 1866. The supplement for this is the Underground Railroad Reminiscences of the Days of Slavery. Um, the third is another supplement called Freedom Railroad Reminiscences of the brave old days of the famous Underground Railroad line. This is from the Burton Historical Collection. The third source would be the John Brown, actual, uh, his men, and they write about 
which you see here called the League of Freedom. So this is published in 1894. Here's an excerpt. It says, there existed something of an organization to assist fugitives and their resistance to their masters. It was found all along the lake border from Syracuse, New York, to Detroit. And none but colored men were admitted into direct and active membership with this League of Freedom. It was quite difficult to trace its workings or know how far the ramifications extended. So in the time period we have here, John Brown's men writing about this. They called it the League of Freedom. And we'll get into more of this. Now, this is Lambert's testimony, testimony coming from his 1886 interview that he gave in the um, post. It is said that he was 70 at the time that he gave this. Um, the Baptist was a little earlier. Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, yeah, earlier. And what is tend to be done with his testimony is they try to say that he exaggerated how many people actually got there and how many people actually got free from the numbers given, which is 1,600. So Lambert's testimony deals with this specific attribute. And it says the Grand Chapter Lodge was located on Jefferson Avenue between Bates and Rudolph in Detroit. The Detroit order included free and self-free blacks and some white men. Their primary business was transporting freedom seekers as part of the Underground Railroad operation and funding settlements in Canada. These are the degrees or the first degrees dealing with this specific movement. Let us say in the first chapter, the degrees were captive, redeemed, and chosen. A branch of the first degree was that of confidence, which was used on the Underground Railroad. It could be bestowed by any one of those in or above the degree of chosen. It was from this degree that the agents set to the South that was selected, and this oath was administered. I do most solemnly and religiously swear and vow that I never will confer the degree of confidence on any person, black, white, male, or female, unless I am sure they are trustworthy. And should I violate the solemn covenant, may my personal interest and in domestic peace be blasted and I personally be denounced a traitor. Agents sent to the South passed the confidence degree after they swore an oath of allegiance, then they memorized passwords towards the fugitives. Here you'll see the confidence ritual. It says to complete the confidence ritual, however, which was the one actively used by the Underground Railroad managers. Word leperous, password crossover, spoken thus, question cross, answer over, first lecture, have you ever been on the railroad? Answer, I have been a short distance. Question, where did you start from? Answer, the depot. Where did you stop? At a place called safety. Question, have you a brother there? I think I know him. I know you. I know you now. You traveled on the road. This conversation was the test. It was taught to every fugitive, and the sign was pulling the knuckle of the right forefinger over the knuckle of the same finger on the left hand. The answer was to reverse the fingers as described. This was the captive degree. When the applicant for the degree of the captive was brought up for examination, he was detained with, while asked what he sought. And... The answer would be deliverance was the answer. How does he expect to get it? By his own efforts. Has he faith? He has hope. He was clad in rough and rag garments, his head bowed, his eyes blindfolded, and an iron chain put about his neck. When his examination was over, his eyes were unbound, and he was admitted to the fellowship degree of captive. When he passed to that of the redeemed, the chains and fetters were stricken off, although before that, when his eyes were unbound and he was a captive, he found above him the members of the large percent, each of them with a whip in his hand. In this way, the organization maintained its typical character. After passing to chosen, there were yet five degrees that the rulers of judges and princes, travelers of Ethiopia, Sterling, Black Knight, and Knight of San Domingo. To pass into these was no small task upon the memory and studios of the aspirant. The last one has a ritual of great length dealing with the principles of freedom and the authorities on revolution, revolt, rebellion, government, and short a digest of the best authorities. Now, um, William Lambert, as we saw that he was a Freemason, he made his own organization 
those were some of the actual rituals of that organization. Um, you saw where it was located at and how they used it to help free the people. So when the new authors begin or old authors begin to write about it, they want to put skeptical, they, they're very skeptical about it. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at other actual societies that existed at the specific time and we're going to look at what Booker T. Washington says. So Booker T. Washington wrote of one in St. Louis and two of John Brown's men mentioned secret societies and several societies in Ohio. The earliest documents mentioned in a secret society came from a member of John Brown's army. Richard Wilf wrote a letter on May 31st, 1858 to Uncle John. After an important pre-attack meeting of Brown's army, Wilf became concerned that some of the men revealed the whereabouts of supplies and details of the mission. Nor am I better pleased to learn from the same source that a certain Mr. Reynolds Colored, who attended our convention, has disclosed its objects to the members of a secret society called the American Mysteries. See the source here on the bottom. So the organization that uh, Booker T. Washington is talking about was found in St. Louis by this specific person called Moses Dixon. When you look here, you'll see this newspaper here from... Um, it's called the Freeman. You see at the top of it, it says, for the benefit of those who have not availed themselves, our $1 rate is extended to August 15th. So you'll see in St. Louis on the Underground Railroad, you will have this specific organization that is also helping and freeing the people. Here's a quick rundown on Mr. Dickerson's accomplishments. It says Moses Dickerson founded the International Order of the Twelve of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. It originally was called the Knights of Liberty and was organized by 12 men to plan an uprising to end slavery. The plan was to recruit for 10 years, then strike. They also helped on the Underground Railroad in Chicago under the name of a smaller group called the Order of 12. Later, the organization became known as a Mutual Aid Society. Um, we spoke about Mutual Aid Societies in the past. Those were designed by the people in the community to save the widowed, the poor, and to uplift the community and run forth the first black insurance companies. Um, later on, they also built an all-black hospital called the Tiberian Hospital in Mississippi in 1942. So this guy here, Moses Dixon, very imperative. This newspaper, The Freedman, speaks about the abolitionist works, etc. For the primary documents on this specific order, this book here, a manual of the Knights of Tabor and the Daughters of the Tabernacle. This you can get on archive.org. It's free. So I hope you understand or learn some things about the Underground Railroad, a brief history on the beginnings, and the works of William Lambert and George DePapsi to help free the people. Peace out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I hope you guys learned something from this build. Hope you got something out of it. So, you know, in this build, went over the beginnings of the Underground Railroad, right? Not only did I go under the beginnings of the Underground Railroad, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I didn't really go into Florida because that's a whole different build. And I was dealing with St. Augustine and all those other things there. I took it on another route. I took the other route, and that's the route to Canada. So that build there is showing you exactly what we did, how you hear the story that it was the graceful Europeans who were doing all the work. Nope, you have the black people that was doing the work. You saw uh, the Blackburn basically riot that took place because of these women going to go free somebody, right? Then you saw the other revolution, or I call it a continuous revolution where, you know, they shot up the guard. This is what we did and we utilize all kinds of methods 
We used everything that we had. We used the toilet. We used the sink. We used the goddamn broom. We used everything that we could possibly do to free ourselves. That's dealing with church, dealing with Freemasonry. But today, you learned about a whole new secret society. One brought up that was only for black people. Only white person that was allowed in was John Brown. Nobody else. They made their own degrees up, made their own thing, talked about um, slavery and the degrees, the captive degree. I know y'all like these secret societies. I know y'all like this stuff, you know? And uh, that's what we was going through. You know what I mean? Free the North. Yeah. And that Tabor point, there's actually a hospital that was built. And, and that hospital wound up being closed, so that sucks, but... We had that as well, you know? So hit the one in the chat if you feel like you learned something from it. Put the one in the chat if you feel like you learned something from this. Captain America says thumbs down. Okay, Captain America, here's the link. Here you go. I want you to come on here, Captain America, and explain the primary sources that I brought up. I want you to tell the black people that's listening that William Lambert get a thumb down, that George DePapsy get a thumb down, that they helped build Moses Dickinson, the man who built the black hospital, get a thumb down. I want you to come on here, Captain America, and uh, tell us why these people get a thumb down. These are the ancestors. So here go the link again. I hope you got Zoom. I mean, here you go. There's the meeting ID and get up there. Come up here and explain yourself why you said thumbs down. I'll be waiting. I'm here. Peace, Sergeant AA. Peace, Michael Phillips. Moo Moo in the building. The Zoom meeting ID and passcode is there. That's right. Salute William Lambert. Oh, Sister Salita Hickman. Ain't seen you in a while. How you doing, sis? Peace. Thurman, peace. Peace to everybody in the building. Hey, Captain America, the light is on you today. You are the only one in the chat that have a thumbs down for black people who made their own organization, walking around with guns, ran up in the courtroom. The black woman runs up in there and frees the goddamn people and shoots the goddamn sheriff. I want you to come up here and explain this, Captain America. Don't get, don't be quiet now. You just put the thumbs down. Or are you just uh, indigenous to the keyboard Indian? Huh? This is why we call you Ranger. Queen, um, peace, Queen Cheetah. Oh yeah, I got the sisters in there too. Yeah, the sisters were banging. They were banging. Oh, let me see this. Uh-oh. I think we got... Oh, that sucks. That's just me. Boo. Hold on. Let me switch something. I'll be right back on here in one second. Give me one second, y'all. Because I want to show my screen for something. And I want to uh wrap this up. But I need to go into this other Zoom need to do something here. Make quotes. Okay. That's done. All right. So let me go to the computer. And let's see if we can dig up here. Let's dig this up. I'm waiting for you, Captain America. Captain America, what's up? Captain America ain't trying to hit the link. Give me one second, fam. Let me hit this here. Damn, this thing is taking long. Give me one second. I know what to do. Come on, give it to me. And get out of this. And go here to Mr. Google. Captain America, 
Why aren't you here in the list? Yo, you named yourself Captain America, bro. <laughs> you talking about the black people who fought to free the people and give them a thumbs down, but you named yourself Captain America, my nigga. <laughs> oh my God, yo. Yo, it's crazy, bro. It's crazy out here in these streets, yo. These YouTube streets is crazy. Captain America hit the button. All right. Where's this thing at? Is it going to pop up here? Nope. I'm try one more and see if it comes up. Um, oh, man. There it is. That's the name of it. I was trying to find the right link so that I can share this so we can see this hospital because a lot of people is texting about this hospital. So we're going to get it up on the screen real quick. We're going to get it up on the screen. Let's look at this. All right. Let's get back into Zoom. Now let's go to share screen. Share to God. Share screen. Share. Bang. Okay. This is called the... Uh, Taborian Hospital. Taborian Hospital. You can, you know, you can go past Wiki to find more about it. But, you know, it opened in 1942, but there's something that predates this. The Great Panther by the International Order of the Twelve Knights and Daughters of Tabor. Everyone on the staff, including doctors and nurses, were black. The facilities included two major operating rooms, an x-ray machine, incubators, electrocardiograph, blood bank, laboratory. Operating came entirely from membership dues and other voluntary contributions. The first chief surgeon of the hospital was T.R.M. Howard, who later became an important civil rights leader in Mississippi. The South is in the building. I told you the North will make sure the South is good. We got y'all, yo. We're going to make sure y'all good. We're going to make sure the South is good. All right? And a mentor to Mega Everett and who? Fannie Lou Hamer, who was often a patient at the hospital, bro. After years of financial pressure, the hospital lost its paternal status in 1967 when the federal government took over, et cetera. Now, here's these guys. So here's the uh, International Order, right? So it was founded in 1846, Anti-Slavery Society. You know, we dealing with Moses Dixon. He said he had 100,000 people who was ready to ride. I don't know what happened. The guy said that he had a vision from Jesus and they didn't do it. I wish they would have did it, but uh, John Brown was the one who wound up riding out and they wanted to see what happened with the Civil War, obviously. But this fraternal order, brought this forth right here. This paternal order brought forth the black hospital that had what? Let's go back. Who worked it? Everyone on the staff, including doctors, nurses, were black. You understand that? This is deep. This shows that it can be done and it was done from utilizing paternity. That's deep. That's deep. Let me see. I think it might go here as well, too. This right here is the hospital. See, Knights and Daughters of Tabar, founded 1872. I hope my screen is showing. Okay. See that? It said construction began 1940 uh, by Miss Kissack, by Mick Kissack. And Mick Kissack, the first African American owner, architecture, and engineering firm in the United States. Yo, man, you ain't getting this nowhere else, bro. 
Y'all not getting this information nowhere else about the people, man. If this door is not motivating, man. I don't know, but let's keep reading. Construction began on the Tiberian Hospital in 1940 by Mick Kissack, the first African American owner, architecture, and engineer, engineering firm in the United States. Recognized as the first HMO, the hospital was built by the 12 Knights and Daughters of Tabwa for $100,000. So back then, all these guys needed was 100 racks. Hospital Rocky. 100 racks. It's different now, of course, but, you know, this is the foundation. I mean, and serve as the primary health care provider for African Americans in the Delta. With two or three doctors on staff at a time, all African American. The hospital had an x-ray room, sterilizer, incubators, two operating rooms, etc. And here's the guy here. This ain't that long. I'll press play. I'll press play. I think I have to put sound on, right? Yeah. Let me see his sound on. Nah, I don't hear it. I don't even hear it. I'm not sorry. I can remember my grandfather was chief grand mentor of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. Prime Evans. Terry Monroe Smith was born July 11, 1876 in Deason, Mississippi. His family was already focused on service to freedmen. They taught that Christ expects service from his people, not just songs and words, real service to others. Our family was among the first to join the Knights and Daughters of Tabor after its founding in 1889. My great-grandfather, R.D. Smith, was the second chief grand mentor of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, and my papa was the third. They built a school in Renova, one of the first for African Americans in the Delta. Stop, stop. We got to stop this. They built a school. These guys built the school, they got hospitals. Come on, we get back into the problem. Let's get back into the problem. They taught oratory, raised money for college scholarships, and gave money awards to top students throughout the region. Education was their focus. Look at the black people. I got to pause these black people. Look at the black people, yo. Wow. Trying to help educate a generation of former slaves. One thing Papa did, he visited sick members of the organization whenever he could. At one point, he was called to a hospital in Rosedale. It was a nicely equipped hospital, but all they had for black people was a filthy basement room. There was no privacy, no consideration for pride or modesty. People went there only out of desperation. On that day, Papa decided to build a hospital. And at that point in history, it looked like an impossibility. He started with 25 cents. The going rate for cotton was $3 a day. But out of that $3, a family would take 25 cents for Knights and Daughters membership. 25 cents is a lot of money if you make $3 a day. And every dime was accounted for. It took P.M. Smith a lot of shoe leather traveling throughout the state and country. He burned up many Buicks, driving one house, one town, one church at a time. Everybody contributed. In 10 years, Papa raised $100,000 to build a hospital, and it was every bit what he envisioned. The Taborian Hospital provided excellent service from 1942 to 1983. Thousands of babies that would have been born in plantation houses were delivered in a clean, well-staffed hospital. Farm accidents that might have ended with somebody losing an arm or a leg or a life had the best results because of excellent medical care. Papa passed away in 1970 at 94 years old. He worked until he died. He left this world knowing he accomplished his life's work. He served a need at a time when the need was great. 
That is my papa's legacy. Damn. God damn. God damn. Let's stop the shit. We'll stop the goddamn shit. That's crazy, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, yeah, 100K wasn't a little bit of money back then, fam. Facts. Well, you know, you learned about a bunch of things today. The Tarball Hospital, first black hospital, first black engineering company or owned architecture company. You learned about two uh, riots, revolts, breakouts. Learned about the secret order of the Negroes or the ancient mysteries. You learned about that. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, the universe is in the back of me. I know y'all see the universe back there. But y'all got any questions about this? If not, you know, I'm going to close this out. Or I think this was a good build. Support the channel. Yeah, I joined the Starfleet, the Asiatic Black Man. That's the mo son. You don't understand what you're looking at, my dude. That is the mother plane right there, bro. That is the mother plane, son. I ain't even gonna break this down to you, son. I ain't even gonna break that down. To you. True story. You just don't understand what you're looking at on my screen, bro. That is the mother plane, bro. Right there. Waiting to come back, son. Support the channel. That's why you're going to keep seeing that. And anytime somebody come up and you see that wheel flying, that's the wheel right there, bro. When you see that wheel pop up, son, you know what time is it. You know what time is it. We need an ADA, ADO, HAA sap. Yeah, we'll get one. we get one. Support the channel. Nah, nah, nah. That ain't the planet of risk. That's the planet of Earth. That's the mother plane. So let me see. Anybody come in the chat? Nobody came in. Any other questions? Melanated Martians is in the building. Cash App, Rob Bourne, Cash App, History Man. I think Danny coming on right after me. I think he going to talk to y'all about Pan-Africanism. I think he put something nice together for y'all. He got a whole series of Pan-Africanism. Cash out, super chat, whatever. Any questions? No questions? Nothing? Well, I just need to see some ones, man, if y'all learned something, if y'all heard something y'all never heard before, yo. Just need some ones, yo. <laughs> All right. Oh, going once, going twice, three times. I'm out of here, man. Yeah, we got some ones. Spree well consciousness, yo. You stupid, bro. Yeah, man. Peace to Shaz, Hunt, A Asa Woods, Yankee in the building. Dee Savento, Daryl Blue, True Story, and Gullah Juice, Johnny Phillip, All Things Popping, Sister Queen Cheetah, Jehudi Mayat, Leo Horse, Sister Saja, Kareem, Peace, He Kareem, Peace to the God, Mumu, I mean, Salida, you know, LaShawn. You know what I mean? Trading war stories, peace. There definitely was a war story. All right. That's Wisdom Secure, Ms. Lauren, and Sister Ann Shua. Centavo. I just said it right. Centavo. Centavo. Peace to Andiot. Andiot, you late to the party. Nah, you should have left Captain America in there. I wanted Captain America to pull up, but he ain't want to pull up. I mean, but yo, I'm out of here, man. Peace to the family. Thanks for watching. 
Uh, I'll see if there's any other question there. If there is none, I'm out. How many push-ups should a grown-ass man be able to complete a week? How many push-ups should a grown-ass man be able to complete each week? Um, 7,000. You should be doing like 1,000 a day. You know what I'm saying? On the yard status. On the yard. You should be able to do 7,000 push-ups a week. That ain't hard. You know what I'm saying? Do start to fit these, you'll be all right. <laughs> but yo, I'm off of here.